So welcome, everybody. I am Suzanne Monk. We are here in Trump Talk Studios, and we're doing a very uh, rare, but I'm excited. We're doing an interview right here in studio with candidate Deborah Lamb, who is running as a at-large candidate for the congressional district in Montana. She's also had some very interesting involvement in a poignant landmark Supreme Court case that is going on. Actually, they're having hearings this week. So I want to introduce everybody to Deborah. Deborah, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me here. So tell us a little bit about where you're from, uh, you know, what you're doing here in D.C. and uh, why you're running for office in Montana. Well, thank you. Um, I'm from Livingston, Montana, mm -hmm. actually in uh, the rural area. Mm -hmm. And I'm here in D.C. for some meetings. Sure. Uh, one of the exciting things is, was this case that you mentioned, the sure. Espinosa case and, uh, Sorry. and actually the pro-life March, right. uh, the March for Life, of which course. is tomorrow. So of I'm very course. excited about that. And actually speaking of that, that's what actually got me started in the political arena. Mm -hmm. I'm a citizen activist. Mm -hmm. I am not a politician, although I have had the opportunity to serve in our state legislature. But what led up to that was my early involvement in starting a pro-life coalition in my local area. Well, great. We had, if you can believe this, in my little town of 7,000 people on Main Street, we had an abortion clinic. Mm. And people mm -hmm. were very upset and wanted to know what they could do about it. We had people that would go there and pray. Right. Um, but we needed to be more organized. Sure. And so we formed a coalition and we actually were able to get that that um, clinic closed. Fantastic. Yeah. And you did that. It's, what I find interesting, you did that through actually social and community engagement. Correct. Because one of the things I've often talked about is that, uh, and I've seen it over the last 10 years, the rates of abortion are going down. We are winning the messaging war. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes when we get too much in the politics, Right. Uh, it, it, it steams up the fight again, right. but I think we, as on the conservative side, have really done a really great thing where we have engaged the community and we're, we're really making headway on the issue by, by doing it more and more in this way. And then what you've seen, what the left has then done, they have pushed the laws to the extreme. So uh, forcing actually, you know, forcing us to re-engage, but I think that's also bringing people in the middle, yeah. uh, you know, moderate individuals who might have supported the right to choose, but certainly don't support late term, don't right. support some of these more radical ideas. That right. get there. So that's wonderful that that, yeah. um, that, that brought you uh, to politics and to, you know, stepping up to the plate, which is, you know, it's a, a an honored calling and not all of us are, are called to do that. And I always appreciate people who do, because I know all the work and effort it takes and time away from your family. And, you know, you're here in DC and you're not yeah. back home. So, you know, it's, it's thank you for, for doing thank that you. and for, for contributing to our country and the conversation. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the case uh, Espinosa versus Montana, because I know everyone on social media has no idea about this because we've been busy with the impeachment circus. Mm -hmm. And of course we were down in Richmond for the second amendment, right. uh, all very important issues. At the same time, this is a huge issue. So I'll inform my viewers a little bit. The case, uh, the Espinosa versus Montana is a case about Fun, the ability for religious families to get the same tax credits and the same financial benefit that the state gives out to public school students who might not be attending a religious school. So in the state of Montana, as I understand it, please correct me if I'm wrong, as we're catching mm -hmm. everybody up, they passed a law that said students who attended religious schools could not get these bonuses or tax credits or uh, financial benefit from the state. Yeah. Well, the end result, um, we can back up after that. Sure. They, um, the Department of Revenue just didn't implement it at all. So no one got the benefit. So it wasn't that they only excluded the religious families. They just said, okay, nobody's getting it. Well, so that's a horrible, a that's a horrible outcome to exactly. someone expressing yes. what I think is a valid concern. And we've seen yeah. this in our schools. We see an indoctrination of left-wing ideas. Yeah. And we see more and more people stepping, uh, pulling their children out of that environment, going to homeschooling, uh, going to uh, Catholic schooling, religious schooling, mm -hmm. faith-based education. So the reason that is, is because the, the public schools are again and again failing our students and they're failing to pass on American values mm -hmm. that we want uh, our kids. So I find it interesting 
that the left obviously would be so upset that religious people would get money that they would take money away from, from other yep. students. From everybody. So what happened in Montana, obviously the case is now in the Supreme Court. So yeah. something happened in Montana to get it there. So following my work with this uh, pro-life coalition, I connected with a group called the Montana Family Foundation. It's mm -hmm. a wonderful organization. They've been fighting that pro-life fight. Mm -hmm. But they had also gotten into the education arena, realizing some of these right. very things that you're talking about. And so I went to work with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and worked in this education arena and served up, um, you know, in government relations with the legislature in the 2011 and 13 sessions and worked on this very bill along with some other school choice measures we right. were hoping for. Right. And, you know, it's not even that it's that big of an amount. We're talking $150. $150 a family. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's it, nothing. It's pennies. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, in the in, in it never it just we couldn't get it passed. Right. So then in the 2015, I had already been elected to the state legislature. Mm -hmm. We were able to get that case brought forward or the bill brought forward again. Right. right. We passed it. Right. The governor didn't sign it. We have a Democrat governor. Mm -hmm. He didn't sign it, but after a certain number of days, it becomes law. Right. So it became law. It goes to the Department of Revenue to administer the program. Sure. And when they looked at it, they said, well, wait a minute, the, this credit could go to a religious school and we don't want that. Right. We, we have what's called a Blaine Amendment in the Constitution. In the Montana Constitution. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that really was an early, it was an 1800s concept and it was really um, prejudiced against the Catholics. Right. right. So it already started out with, <laughs> yes. you know, ill intent. Uh, but the education establishment Certainly. has used that as a way to protect um, all money. They right. think all money belongs to them. All of Correct. our money, no Correct. matter what, should go. They certainly to, don't want that to go to charter schools. They right. don't want that to go to alternative right. education uh, or religious right. education. They've been very it in Chicago across the country. They're very much that way. It's all for government schools in their minds. Right. So we the interesting thing about it is this has never been government money it's right. always our money correct and the way the bill was structured is that the money would go to an organization mm -hmm. that would take money in from individuals or corporations that that pool of money then could be given out to individuals for sure. their family use right so it never was money that was going to the government that's then coming right it's back. not it's not taxpayer revenue that they've taken right. out of the budget somewhere else and right. put into a fund this is money that's right. coming in from outside sources right mm -hmm. right totally different and yet they money. still were but they want it adamant to limit it yes yes so that then got challenged that that the law conflicted with the montana supreme court decision right. obviously that then went uh to the the next court up yeah to up to appeal to that, and, and I believe it was a, a writ of certiorari. Certiorari. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm not good at it. I can read it, but it's harder to pronounce. Uh, you, one of the the members in the case asked the Supreme Court to take a look at this case, and so that is how it has gotten to the right. Supreme Court now. Right. So it's uh, as I have read, the hearings were yesterday. They had hearings That's yesterday right. on the 22nd. Yeah. And this case seemed to have come out of uh, the blue. It has mm -hmm. blindsided, I think, everybody on both mm -hmm. sides of the of the aisle because yesterday I knew nothing about it and I do a little bit of research so we can have this conversation today and every single yeah. news organization in the country is putting out uh, an article about it. So there's a lot of panic. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can feel they're sensing a lot mm -hmm. of concern. And on the left, it appears that they think this is going to cause the sky to fall. Mm -hmm. Because the language in the articles is that this will change a hundred years of education. It's going to transform <laughs> our educational system and our ideology. I think that's a little bit superlative, but you probably know, know more than me. What do you, if the case should uh, in the Supreme Court uphold the law that you are suggesting to allow both religious and non-religious individuals to receive these, these benefits? Is that going to change the face of education for everyone? Can you tell me what you think is going to happen 
uh, with this case. I don't think if if it were to, to go through, it's not going to change public education. It is such that would be such a long term impact. Sure. Um, and what's really funny when you talk about the superlatives and the world ending, etc. When I was fighting this in the legislature, mm -hmm. um, I had the teachers union, the head of the teachers union, call me a terrorist, mm -hmm. and that I was going to undo forty years of his hard work. Yes, his hard work to keep all the money for the public schools. Right. right. We're talking one hundred and fifty dollars for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's not enough for a family to send their children to a private school. Certainly in no way. But it's a help. Yeah. But the other thing that is preventing are people that maybe still have their kids in the public school, mm -hmm. but let's say they have a special needs child. And sure. we all know that while there was supposed to be funding from the federal government to come, there hasn't been enough. Right. And so $150 to them to maybe get a little extra tutoring or some special training sure. or whatever, Sure, that could make a huge difference. Uh, so to deprive anybody of that small amount is, is ridiculous. Well, and I think, I think where this case becomes something that, you know, the Supreme Court and the nation pays attention to is the government, we're very clear. Let, let, me, let me find my little constitution here. I love, I love keeping this little buddy real close. <laughs> oh, I love because Because show me where education is supposed to be. Well, yeah, and, and what I find very interesting, and, and I was thinking on this as I was talking about it, because Congress should make no law respecting an establishment of religion. But what, what has happened with the law out in Montana is they have made a, a law uh, almost a disestablishment right. of religion. And I would argue establishing secularism as, as the government religion. Mm -hmm. So that is actually not what the First Amendment suggests. The First Amendment suggests that whether I am a Catholic or I am a Protestant or I'm an Episcopalian or I'm a Jew or I'm a Muslim or I'm uh, a Zoroastrian or what, uh, any number of faiths, the government cannot establish that right. as the given faith. It cannot use its economic benefit, its power benefit, to establish a specific way of thinking. But does not this law literally attempt to do that? Is that not, a, a, in, a, in a way, what this law tries to do? It tries to say, if you don't think in our right. secular way, if you have a faith idea about how your child should be educated, whatever faith that may be, you don't get the benefit of the federal government. I think that's a direct violation of the First I Amendment. I, I agree with you. So it is, in that sense, mm -hmm. a big deal. It is, in that sense, uh, I think a a a small a small shot across the bow mm -hmm. of a very very big issue, mm -hmm. and one I think we are experiencing across the country in our school systems with the the decay mm -hmm. of the educational system with common core and with many of these other educational things that are just not teaching our kids they're not learning well but also with the infiltration of radical leftist ideas uh anti-trump ideas uh they, they had them singing songs to obama back in the right, day right so this political ideology has now infested our public schools well, it absolutely has. And um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but one of the things that I did in Montana is when we learned that Common Core was coming into our schools mm -hmm. and that it was going to be implemented, uh, again, there were lots of parents and teachers even that were very concerned and they wanted to know what could be done. I formed a coalition, I formed a group that fought against that and uh, we all advocated with the various education groups, et cetera, um, because we knew how horrible it was going to be for kids. Sure. And they did exercise their right to remove their children from public schools right. because they were being indoctrinated right. and they weren't learning. And they chose to walk and either homeschool or go to a private school, such as a religious now, school. Now, when you take your kids out of public school, do you get a tax credit? Because obviously our taxes go to cover public schools. If your child is not using those services, no. do you get a credit from that? Or are no. you still paying for other kids to be in the public school system while you are additionally paying for your child's education? No, you get to continue paying for the government schools, and then you have to figure out how you're going to pay for your private school. 
So Four now we long. have families who are forced to basically pay for two educations Correct. for every child mm -hmm. merely because they choose to educate their child based in faith mm -hmm. as opposed to through the, the mm -hmm. government public secular system. You know, and as you know, referring to the Constitution, the responsibilities that were given to the federal government were to protect our liberty. Mm -hmm. And one of those should be education choice mm -hmm. and freedom to educate your children in a manner that you deem appropriate. Correct. But instead, um, we have now developed this Department of Education, which I know our president is looking at um you know cutting out and trimming lines. back and yes. certainly controlling and how more back to the uh, certainly how our revenue comes in right it's basically been i've called the department of education my whole uh, funded career uh -huh. basically a ponzi scheme we take the money out yeah. of the states we take a little bit of money off the yeah. top we send you back the rest of your right. money it's right. not a system right. that right. helps anyone it's locally. a jobs program yeah mm -hmm. for government workers right right yeah. <laughs> so so we have so we have parents out there and and i'm sure this is happening in montana because it's happening everywhere homeschooling yeah. is becoming vastly yes. more popular parents are almost leaving in droves mm -hmm. what sort what are you hearing from parents there on the ground what frustrations are you hearing what are their concerns going forward with at, with the educational system how the public school system is is treating them? well <sighs> really until common core came along i don't think parents really understood the level of indoctrination mm -hmm. they were seeing the changes but they couldn't quite put their finger on it mm -hmm. but once they got involved and they were looking at the homework assignments and looking what was being shown to them on these ipads and computers they realized the level of indoctrination right because they would send me all of these lessons that they were getting it was extremely um, prejudicial against anyone sure. who was conservative or um, didn't go along with whatever the current right. um, Obama group wanted to do. Sure. So they wanted to figure out what to do. We tried very um, uh, as much as we could to try and get into the school boards. Mm -hmm. um, that's very difficult. Sure, they have established um, themselves very well and they yeah. protect those seats yeah. from infiltration very yeah. Really? And, and so their decisions were, we've got to do something. And we did. We had at least 10% increase in at least 10% of the students who decided, uh, families that decided sure. to move them out of that system. Well, and I know I personally, in, in Chicago, we've talked about this uh, across the country. We've often talked about a voucher system mm -hmm. by which uh, the individual parents can use the money that they would otherwise be using the public school would be paying for them mm -hmm. but they can then take that tax revenue that they paid into the mm -hmm. system that would go to their student and apply that to other schools and there's been vast resistance yeah. by the growingly leftist teachers unions yeah. that to oppose that they don't even want charter schools no. they don't even want schools uh that might pay the teachers a little less because they fear that that's going to lower mm -hmm. their wages. But in schools like Chicago, in, in school districts like Chicago, like Detroit, like New York, these schools are not only failing these students, they're killing them. They're, yeah. they're literally at physical yeah. danger and risk of uh, a life of crime or a, a short uh, youthful mm -hmm. experience with gangs, which yeah. is so unfortunate. Yeah. Do you have some of that in Montana? What are the, uh, uh, are the school systems reflecting some of that big inner city, big city kind of stuff out there in Montana? Well, um, we certainly are seeing drug issues. Mm -hmm. um, that's become a growing problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do want to back up on one thing. Sure. Um, with regards to our movement with the parents and families understanding how dangerous this common core and liberal agenda has become. Right there were also a lot of teachers that recognize it. And we have great teachers. That's a good point. Um, and I wanna make sure that your audience understands that yes. not every teacher is bad, not every teacher believes in this sure. system, but it's a job. Right. Um, but we had a huge number of early retirements because they just, they knew they could not go that next level. Right. Um, and we, that's so unfortunate because yes. we have teachers who have had experience, yes. who have had long careers dedicating themselves to right. teaching children it's a, it's a passion right you know i taught for 15 years myself uh in my 20s and 30s uh after school theater 
preschool, many different mm-hmm. ages. And you learn very quickly that if you don't want to be there, if you don't love the kids, if you're not there with that love of seeing that light turn on when they figure something out, yeah. you're not going to be a happy person. It's a hard job. It's it, it actually does not pay as well in mm-hmm. many cases as one mm-hmm. might, especially in the lower grades and the preschools and such. So, and these are such important mm-hmm. ages. Yes. So certainly there are a lot of teachers who are frustrated, just as frustrated with the, with the system. And I'm glad you made that point because certainly one of the things we see with the urban environments, the unions are mm-hmm. vicious mm-hmm. and they will threaten you and right. intimidate you if you as a teacher would step out of line. But those Montana teacher voices are actually voices that can start that conversation of teachers against Common Core, teachers against the decay of our education We system. have the same problem in Montana with the teachers unions mm-hmm. because they have threatened some of those people. Mm. I had people that were coming to one of the Common Core presentations mm-hmm. that I had in Billings mm-hmm. and one of the teachers that was planning to be there was threatened and was not and, and didn't show up. It, she was scared. Yeah. I've had other school choice bills, whether it was a charter bill um, or some of the others where teachers were coming from out of state, where they left our state, good mm-hmm. teachers yeah. that went to our neighboring state where they did have charter schools right. and wanted to talk about how, how wonderful it was. Yeah. And it doesn't take away from public schools. No. No. It actually- In fact, it, I think, and where we have had success, uh, the few schools that they allow mm-hmm. to charter in, in Chicago, it actually has put pressure mm-hmm. on the rest of the system to to step up the bar. Yeah, And um, we found, economically is that for the same dollar, so for every dollar a public school spends and a charter school spends, the students are getting uh, a much higher level of education for that dollar in the charter school. So to get the same level of education at public school, the charter school is spending a fraction of that, a dollar that the public school is. So it's a, it's a more affordable system ultimately and where there are, there are bad charter schools that have not gone mm-hmm. well, but there are many uh, that have gone well, it does something that I think is so important. It gives the parents and the community that access that we have had throughout education in our country. Mm-hmm. It was the parents that came together. Mm-hmm. You know, back in our little, I come from the, the, the old west, you know, the southwest, mm-hmm. Arizona and such, and the parents would come together in a community and they'd hire a teacher yeah. to come teach in this little one room school. Right. So it was always a parent based system. Yeah. And we've lost that by putting the federal government mm-hmm. in place. And I think this case mm-hmm. begins, uh, begins part of the process of maybe mm-hmm. uh, unraveling that yeah. and can move us to a way where we can maybe get to that voucher program and actually have real school yeah. choice. Yeah. Well, and it would be more of a free market system because right. then everybody's um, desire yes. to create a better end result, um, they would have a reason to do that. If you have to fight for those same dollars, they don't want to have to do that. They just want it to be an automatic. Well, and they've had this problem with things like magnet schools in Chicago, mm-hmm. where there are schools that are doing very well, and that they then are flooded with with applications and students. Obviously, mm-hmm. the school can't take all of those in. So now we have lottery programs. We have right. all of these things that have right. nothing to do with the merit of the student. Clearly, there are more students mm-hmm. desiring a better education and an access to a better schooling experience, Mm -hmm. but we're not providing that. We're not providing that. And we're actually putting blocks in place that protect uh, our legacy teachers and our tenured Mm -hmm. uh, administration officials, you know, Mm -hmm. the the teachers administration, um, superintendents and Mm -hmm. such. Yes, Mm -hmm. the upper, you know, the the, the bureaucracy of our education system, we're protecting their jobs as well. Yeah. And the interesting thing about this Espinoza case that we're referring to is I, I understand where their concerns are because, um, you know, it's a small amount now and it could grow. Mm-hmm. And and well, it should, because really, if parents could retain more of their own income yeah. and make the right choices for their children, who knows the, those children the best? Yes. The parents. Well, and I certainly can see how this would set up a precedent that other states can begin to build voucher programs upon, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I feel like by reading through the case, mm-hmm. this has been a block, I think, mm-hmm. to some of those programs, because they know the students, yeah. the teachers are going to come in, they're going to resist this money going to religious schools, mm-hmm. they're going to, re- that's right. where the battle's going to be. And yeah. I think this will set a precedent that will help some of those laws move forward. Yeah, it, it's really twofold. 
Um, it really is about educational choice and education freedom, but it's also about religious freedom. Yeah, and a free speech issue on a, really, a, a, a freedom yeah. of religion yeah. and freedom of expression issue. Right, right. And we are supposed to have that freedom to choose. And in my opinion, my personal opinion, you know, a government school with its religion, um, anti-religion is a religion. Correct. I agree. Um, and therefore, they should not be given precedence over Correct. anybody else's choice. Correct. The, the, the Constitution was so very clear yeah. that the government's yeah. role is to not establish. Right. And I feel that the education system, by right. removing religious liberty from the process, right. has in fact done exactly right. what the Constitution right. said not to. Yeah. Yeah. So not only are you doing all this work <coughs> and uh, addressing this school issue, uh, but you want to come up and protect our Constitution as, as, as a congresswoman. I absolutely do. So tell us a little bit about where your race is at. Uh, do you have an opponent? Is there a primary? You know, what is the Montana race? How is that different from any other states? Because as you know, each and every state actually has a very different process. Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned in the beginning, we ha we are an at-large state. We have one congressional district. That's the whole state. Okay. So we have one, one opportunity here. And our likely Democrat opponent mm -hmm. is hard to believe. But Montana could have its own AOC. Oh, please don't. Please don't. And, and as you know, I mean, we are really at a tipping point with socialism and moving so far to the left. Correct. That if we don't protect every seat that we have, yes. then we could lose this battle in this tipping point that we're at. Yes. And as a product of living the American dream, I found out that there are kids now they've never heard about american exceptionalism mm -hmm. they don't even know what the american dream is all about mm -hmm. they have no hope right that everything you know they think the world is going to end in 10 years yes. because climate change is real and and we're on a death spiral right. well if you remember in the 70s it was an ice age yes so you know and the hole in the ozone layer in yeah. the 80s and you know it's and been a, a disaster of, of yeah. doom yeah and the unfortunate thing is we're abusing children to the point where they are um, yes. so anxious and so have so much anxiety yes. that they are losing yeah. their health. And some people are losing their lives. Well, and we were talking even, I was talking with uh, some of my uh, black conservatives here in the DC area just mm -hmm. earlier today about this exact issue, about the, uh, the fact that there is so much of our history mm -hmm. in America that is much more diverse then we're right. telling these these right. young black children right. who then are come up with no sense of ownership mm -hmm. of America because mm -hmm. according to the le the leftist narrative they were dra their ancestors were mm -hmm. dragged here against their will and they're not part of this country mm -hmm. at all and when re in reality uh, we had uh, free black men who were here in the Jamestown right. colony right. who were integral in the formation of our yeah. country who fought the revolutionary battles. And we're not telling these stories. So these young people have no ownership. Right. And I think that happens in the white community, in the Asian right. It happens in every right. at every race and religious group has had a role in this country and should know the history so they can mm -hmm. embrace that. But we're not doing that. And we're not right. doing it here. And we're not doing it, I think, yeah. out in Montana either because yeah. the left needs the lie right. that America is not exceptional. As they always say when I wear this hat, when was America great? When wow. was America great? They love to say, yeah. and or they say the other thing. Um, they say, uh, "Well, isn't it isn't it great now?" Either it's either mm -hmm. how how are you changing it? Mm -hmm. They're so afraid of changing mm -hmm. it, and I keep reminding them, "No, we're fulfilling the promise." You know, right. this this beautiful little constitution was not a you know, a uh, uh, key ready right. country. This was a this was a, an aspirational mm -hmm. document that we still today mm -hmm. are attempting to manifest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's so important that we mm -hmm. protect it. Absolutely. So what will be your goals as a congresswoman? What what issues, what focus do you really want to focus on as you know, what committees would you like to be mm -hmm. on? What issues do you want to take? What bills are mm -hmm. percolating in your head <laughs> that you might want to put on the floor of the house? Well, it's kind of funny because first of all, I would probably want to undo some things. Sure. Um, and I think that's one of the easiest ways to drain the swamp is to start unraveling yes. because we have built an administrative state that is sort of running everything else. Yep. Um, that was one of the things I tried to do in the state legislature is mm -hmm. when I wrote a bill, that bill was complete. 
Mm -hmm. There was no rulemaking authority that was granted to some other body. Right. So when I wrote the charter bill, for instance, there was no rulemaking. And then two years when we come back, if it was something wasn't working, we'll change it. Sure. As it was intended. Right. So and you see, that's the perfect example of what happened in, with Espinoza. Mm -hmm. Our Department of Revenue decided to interpret it because there was some rulemaking authority to implement some right. of this. And so they chose a very bizarre way of handling it and just not allowing the, the credit at all. I'm really moved, actually, and excited that to talk to a congressional candidate who was very clear about the bureaucracy, the unelected bureaucracy mm -hmm. component of so many right. bills, because I think, you know, even folks on the conservative side, mm -hmm. they're happy to sign over a bill mm -hmm. that sets up a whole new bureaucracy. Right. And right. yeah, that's great for Washington, D.C. Right. restaurants and parking garages and all the other jobs mm -hmm. money that's going to come in because mm -hmm. now we have a new bureaucracy here mm -hmm. to house an office. But it's not helping the American people. No, it isn't. And um, there would be other jobs and new jobs created, but they would be different. Right. Um, and there would be jobs that aren't literally taking away the voice of right. the people because right. when you pass a bill that gives over all of this rulemaking decision it's mm -hmm. happened through obamacare yeah. it's happened again and again we've mm -hmm. seen uh, a bill get passed department of homeland security for example mm -hmm. and then it's bureaucracies and thousands and thousands of employees the right. costs go up the power mm -hmm. goes up and the the power of the people gets drip drip, drip taken away it's diminished yep and I think that's part of, you know, what's gotten us into the trouble we're in. So those are some of the things I would be looking at. I'm not so much wanting to bring new bills, but rather looking at where we can make cuts. Um, and I think you make a really good point also when it says we, we, we're in a really crossroads here because yeah. certainly we need to take back the House yep. from the Democrats. We are seeing right now this impeachment circus going on mm -hmm. the two articles that the house has passed already have already been pushed over to the senate but as you probably know the house is looking at additional articles they want to keep working on it they want to keep investigating they don't say they're done and i've said many times the only way we're going to end this impeachment craziness is if we take back the house we have to flip the house we have to flip the house because you're right it is craziness um there's nothing even constitutional about it correct. at this point correct so we have to have some strong leaders that are willing to take a stand. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying giving anybody a pass on either side of the aisle. Sure. But when it's so blatant right. and when we know the motivations, it's right. gotten to the point of ridiculousness. And the fact that we have a president that has been so successful in mm -hmm. spite of it speaks volumes, mm -hmm. I think, to his ability and his caring for all people because he has helped all people, not just one class of people. Right. And I get tired of people saying, oh, it's just for the rich. No, it isn't. And in, I mean, in no way is. And when you yeah. see again and again, uh, you know, the, in fact, a bill he just passed recently, which is allowing uh, Native Americans to actually, they're dealing with some of the crime and violence right. and, and murders that are going on right. our re Indian reservations that because of the way the, the laws are set up there, mm -hmm. they have not gotten the same treatment and law enforcement uh, cooperation that are, are, are non you know, we're, uh, we're dealing with that now on Indian land. Right. So the, he's the one who's reaching yeah. out and doing things that have right. been sitting for decades right. and done. Right. So yeah. uh, where are you at as far as the campaign or uh, what can we do to help you out? Is there a website that you can go to? Uh, can we donate? What can we uh, throughout the country and all my listeners from just about everywhere? How can we help Deborah Lamb come to Congress from Montana? Well, I would love to have support from anywhere because it is about saving America mm -hmm. one state at a time. Mm -hmm. I represent Montana. Mm -hmm. I do have a primary I have five guys and myself. Mm -hmm. And then we have a primary for the Democrats, but it's pretty clear that that candidate is going to be a socialist. Sure. Um, a woman that I served with in the state house and she is obviously very liberal. Um, you can look at her record. You can look at my record. Mm -hmm. I have a very good conservative constitutional record. Um, my website is DebraLam.com. Great. D-E-B-R-A-L-A-M-M. Great. .com. Um, donations would be greatly appreciated. Sure. Um, I don't have to have the most money, but right. I need enough money. Yeah. Yes. Well, so. my, I feel like those Montana <laughs> politics dollars might go a little farther than the D.C. Yes. swamp dollars over yeah, here. So yeah. every little donation, yeah. I'm sure, can help out. Uh, you know, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars—what you can contribute. Absolutely. And uh, certainly, this is an exciting race.
because to have uh, uh, another Republican conservative woman, mm -hmm. I think it's and to have the first one since the first Republican woman was elected ever from Montana, the first Republican woman ever was no no Jeanette Ray I'm I, you might want to I was trying yeah, to get your attention okay. on this yeah. Jeanette um Je Jeanette Rankin, Rankin was the first woman in Congress ever I see and she had she was a Republican be, she Republican be and from Montana fantastic Montana has not elected a woman to Congress since her well it's about time 103 years. so that's why 103 years since since the last she was elected well, again uh in the second world war so what a historic thing what you're yeah. uh, from montana for right. montana to have the honor of having the first female congress person mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. and to have that be a republican by the way y'all need to pay attention to that <laughs> you know um they like to say that that women lean left but no this <laughs> no history it's important uh but what we really definitely need is then to bring uh, we need to bring that history back and i feel it's time to send another smart conservative caring about our families focused on issues that the average american is worried about and worried about our children and our future and she loves this little guy yes i do <laughs> so that that's what we need and so we're gonna i'm gonna send this out everybody deborah lamb i thank you so much for thank coming you. here we're going to do everything we can to support you and get the word out you. about your campaign. And thank you for the work you're doing uh, with this case. And uh, please keep us posted as the as the case moves forward. Absolutely. We'd love to be able to report to everyone that it is a huge victory and religious liberty and liberty of all kinds has won the day. Yeah. So Absolutely. thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. And we do that. And that'll be in the footage.